Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Allison Schilling, the Manager of Public Programs at the Concord Museum. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's forum on New England Stone Walls, which is one of the programs that we're offering in conjunction with our new temporary exhibition, Home, Paintings by Lauren Coleman. In 2017, the Concord Museum received an anonymous gift of 47 works of art by Lauren Coleman. Starting tomorrow, visitors can see a selection of the works displayed in a new exhibition, which will run through January 31st. This exhibition celebrates the work of an accomplished artist who has strong Concord connections and who explored New England with a sense of wonder and authenticity. You'll hear tonight about writers and artists who held a reverence for New England stone walls. Lauren Coleman is certainly a member of that renowned group. So I hope you can come and visit the museum to see the works. Our speaker this evening, Robert Thorson, is the professor and interim head of geosciences at the University of Connecticut and author of seven books, ranging from a Smithsonian award-winning illustrated children's book to a critically acclaimed 421 page book of literary criticism published by Harvard University Press. And most relevant to tonight's program, Professor Thorson has published two books on New England stone walls. Professor Thorson is New England's foremost expert on stone walls. Coupled with the extensive writing and research, he is the coordinator of the Stonewall Initiative, New England's premier resource for mm. historic stone walls. And Professor Thorson is joining us from his home in Stores, Connecticut. Our moderator this evening is Tom Putnam, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director of the Concord Museum. As always, we thank everyone who has tuned in to, to watch tonight's program. If you wish to submit a question during the discussion, please do so in the chat and YouTube and I'll relay it to Tom. We hope you will join us again next week for a screening of the film, The Making of Joe Wheeler, A Concord Story, which takes a look at a change in Concord from the perspective of a man who grew up on Thoreau Farm during the depression and World War II. Tonight's program is free and open to all, and we are grateful to everyone who chose to donate during the registration. Your gift directly supports these programs that bring award-winning historians and scientists like Professor Thorson to your homes. And if you enjoy tonight's program and wish to make a contribution, there's a link in the YouTube description to do that. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy tonight's program. So Allison, am I good to go? Yes, you can get started when I go back. So I'm ready to start. Can somebody hear me out there? You okay, Allison? Uh, the title, Concord Laid in Stone. I think that makes sense. You're looking at a, uh, at a very interesting early uh, vegetation picture here along Estabrook Road or the trail that Henry Thoreau took many, many times. Not really a road, it was laid out but never actually turned into a road. Next slide. And here we have truth in advertising. I always have to look up what it is I agreed that I would be doing uh, because sometimes I forget I've been, I gave the wrong talk once. And ever since then, I've always decided to go back and check what is it I'm gonna do. I am indeed gonna talk about preserving Concord stone walls. I will be treating them like landforms and I will be bringing the geological perspective to that. So let's have the next slide, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> I wanna thank Allison and Tom for setting this up. Uh, it seems like uh, it was an invitation a long time ago. I knew it was sometime in November, and then all of a sudden it was uh, uh, two days from now. So uh, I pulled a talk together that I hope will last about 25 minutes, maybe a little bit less, because I'm very much looking forward to questions from the audience and a dialogue with Tom later on today. So first thing we need to go is say, here's a kind of a typical Concord stone wall, and just plant that in your head as we see many of the other slides. 
uh, rough tumbled, some rounded boulders, some slabby ones, about thigh high, uh, nothing seriously laid. Uh, those are the key components of a standard uh, conquered wall. Next slide. I'm gonna start with a quote and an image. And the quote is from Simon Shama. I love this book, Landscape and Memory. I believe it's a 1995 book. It's a great big fat doorstopper on architectural history all around the world. Um, and yet it ends with this quote. There are places woven within the boundaries of modern metropolitan sprawl where the boundaries between past and present, wild and domestic collapse altogether. This is Thoreau's kind of suburb. I just love it that he ends that book. It's the stone walls that add, that add that architecture that draws his interest. Next slide. And here from the well-known book of Thoreau's journal quotes and paintings by N.C. Wyeth, Men Have Conquered. I believe it's a 1960s book. Um, we have a journal entry from Henry Thoreau, October 27th, beautiful fall day, 1857, at the peak of his sojourning. And he writes about Brooks Clark building stone walls barefoot. Brooks Clark was building walls all the time for fun in Concord. And that is not the story, all right, that I'm gonna be telling later on. Most of these walls in Concord were not built for fun. Uh, I would question some of the ideas in this image, but uh, we'll just leave it for now. Uh, that's somebody stacking a wall rather than carefully laying it. Next slide. I do have an outline for such a short talk some key concepts of terminology. And then the point about Thoreau says that a lot of people look at things, but who really sees things? So I wanna take a couple of slides on seeing rather than merely looking. And then I was asked to talk about old and New England as special places for stone walls. And I'll do that. And I think a very important point for me is the signature landform idea. Stone walls are the signature landforms of rural inland New England. They're the key that designates us from other regions. And I'll try to tell you why. A little bit about Concord geohistory. For that, we'll go look at, uh, at some, of the, some of the special attributes of Concord and why its walls and its places look a little different from others. And then a special note for the glacial handling by means of uh, uh, what did the glacier do with our stones to make the walls of Concord look the way they do. And then finally, wall history and function. And by wall history, I mean, how did they get, get built and why and what purpose did they serve? Well, we could spend several hours on that and I don't think I will, but I'm gonna make a few key points. So that's the outline and I'll see if I can get through it fairly quickly. Next slide. Terminology. First of all, stone and rock are not the same thing. Rock is the material of the earth's crust. It is a material. It's what the crust is made of. Like if somebody gave you a wooden chair, it is simultaneously wood and it is a chair. So it is a material and an object. Rock is the material, the stuff made of the earth's crust. And stone is an object made from that material. And the smaller and the more precious and the more beautiful and the more special and the more derived and the more useful it is, the more likely you are to call it stone rather than rock. You do have people calling the stone walls of New England rock walls, and where that is the local idiom, it tends to be where the stones are rougher and bigger and closer to the primitive condition. So rock walls, okay, it's the local variant of a stone wall, and they're all stone walls if they're useful or made of objects. Uh, second terminology, wall versus fence. A fence comes from the same root word as to fence, as in the sport, or defense or offense. You know, it's basically about a boundary. And so a fence is something that keeps something in or keeps something out. A wall, on the other hand, is an architectural term. It either supports or it divides, as in the walls in your building. You do have exterior walls, but you also have interior ones. And the same thing is true with stone walls. So many, many fences are made of walls, but not necessarily the other way around. The invisible fence is a perfectly good fence. And most of the fences in nature are probably invisible. You know, they're basically territorial boundaries by organisms and uh, I mean by animals. And, uh, and those are perfectly good fences. A scent marking is a good fence. And finally, a dichotomy between history and prehistory. I don't believe in prehistory. 
if I believed in prehistory, then everything a geologist does to work out the history of planet Earth isn't history. So I just call it all history. And that's certainly the way I treat stone walls. Next slide. OK, Thoreau says it's not what you look at, but what you see. Now I got two slides to deal with this. The first one is one I call approaches. And with approaches, I have four ways of looking at an object, every object, you, me, my computer, the screen, this talk, or in this case, that beautiful red painted boulder that's painted with a mineral called Jasper. And that's because that was a fracture in a geothermal fissure, you know, when New England was being rifted apart during the Triassic and Jurassic, the age of the dinosaurs, taken apart and filling those central valleys full of volcanic lava flows. You can see the lava in the upper right there. Okay, so, so that's the object that catches my attention, but it's surrounded by others. So if I'm just looking at that from the point of view of utility, I'm going to say, well, that's a stone and I'm going to use it, all right, to help build a wall, to perhaps make a fence or to keep my cattle in one place and not the other. That's all about utility. Evocation, you know, how does it make you feel? The aesthetics. How do you respond to something like that? Well, I respond to the shapes and the sizes and the colors, but it's got nothing to do with utility. It has everything to do with the evocation of my feelings, especially aesthetic feelings. And then there's a story. And a story is not about evocation or feelings, and it's not about how can I use it. It's about what the heck happened. You know, that's the, the history that I'm talking about on the geo history. And so when I am a skilled observer of stones and I look at that, I start telling myself a story, a story about volcanic lava flows and rifting the crust apart and then steaming fissures, you know, and then a glacier that comes by and strews the stone all around. And then somebody that comes up and picks that up. That's the story. Somebody with a folk art sensibility who would face that red on the outside. And then there's also a story in the rounded glacial stones to the lower left and the Jurassic red bed dinosaur footprint stone in the upper left. So there's all kinds of stories that don't have anything to do with the evocation or the utility. And the last one is system. The system answers the question, how does it work? What is the mechanism? What's the process? How did it get here? Not in terms of time, but in terms of mechanism. That is a natural system. And you know, that in this case is all about mineralogy and aqueous solutions and, and uh, geothermal heat and those sorts of things. So when I see a stone wall, these are all the things that I go through my head and I try and ask myself, why don't you look at it four different ways? You can do the same. You can go outside tomorrow, you can look at a stone wall and say, what's the use? How does it make me feel? What's its story? And how does it work? Next slide. There also says, you know, it's not what you look at, but what you see. There's another way of looking at it, a little bit simpler. Everything is made of a material. Everything has a form or a shape. Everything has a process that created it. And there's also time involved. There's four kinds of time, you know, eternal time, cyclic time, arrow time, and sort of catastrophic singularity one times. So there's those four different aspects are present in every stone wall. So approaches are about how you look at something and aspects are the attributes in every single thing you look at. And that's what goes through my head when I look at a stone wall. Next slide. Now, old and New England. We're gonna be referencing uh, my book, Stone by Stone, which believe it or not was published in 2003. That's almost 20 years ago. And that first chapter in that book is Old and New England. And I tried to make the point that the early English Puritan settlers who came here found real familiarity in the rocks and the stones that they got in New England relative to Old England. And it might've been one of the reasons why it felt so familiar, not the least of which was it also faced the Atlantic. But when the rocks of Britain and the rocks of New England were being created, they were in the same seam of a mountain belt that extended all the way up between Greenland and Norway. And then that purple rock in there is the stuff that's all over, you know, uh, sort of East Concord, Boston, Rhode Island, and Southeastern Connecticut. That purple is called Avalon. That was a continent that got squashed between ancient North America and Gondwana land, which is really Africa, and Northern Guana, which is really Europe. So basically, 
all of the stones in New England were similar to many of the stones in Ireland and England and Scotland. And they felt normal. They even had that old red sandstone, you know, that they could find in both places. So I'll just leave it at that. There's a story here about making mountains and making rocks that is fascinating. And England and New England are related even before an ocean came between them. They used to be along the same root of a mountain sea. Next slide. Signature landform, probably the most important idea in this talk because they asked me, well, what is so special about New England? Why does it have walls and the other regions don't? Well, the answer to that is that there are stone walls in every state. You can find them in cliff ruins in Arizona. You can find them in, in piles in Michigan. You can find them in, uh, in the Sierras. You can find them here and there. But if you're anywhere else in the country, you can even find them in a place where Stonewall Jackson gets its name you know, down there in the Appalachians. So yes, you have stone walls and then you have a different kind of stone wall in the Kentucky bluegrass. So you get stone walls all over the country, but when you're in New England, the big problem is explaining why they're not there. Any other part of the country, you explain why they are there. So these are the things that are nearly everywhere, especially in Southern New England, in the circle of blue that I've shown you. On the right, you're looking at the basic topography uh, uh, you know, reconstructed, uh, colorized, uh, topographic model of New England. And I think that what you can see here for those states is New England is a very discrete region. It's a almost sort of lozenge-shaped, tapered end uh, mountain route, you know, that basically curves to the east around the Gulf of Maine. That is one coherent region. And all of New England is about 71,000 square miles. And the mid-sized state I grew up in in Minnesota is 84,000. So the state that I grew up in, the mid-sized state, not Texas, not Alaska, not California, the mid-sized state that I grew up in is bigger than all of New England, including the Maine that you have never seen. So at this region in that blue circle, is sort of like a Southern. And basically what that is on the left now is that if you were to just draw a circle that takes in the Stonewall phenomenon, making sure to get in much of Vermont and New Hampshire and Southern Maine and making sure to get Fairfield County, Connecticut and making sure to get Nantucket. You know, if you draw a circle that will include all of those, the center of that circle is right near Worcester. And that's really the epicenter of a phenomenon. And that's what we're talking about you know, a hundred mile radius or something like that, or hundred and some odd mile radius around Worcester will take in most of the phenomena. So it's the signature landform of this region. Why? Let's go to the next slide. Three reasons. In the upper left, we have a Venn diagram. Now, one thing about New England scenery, you know, we're familiar with town greens and church steeples and sugar maples, you know, you know the settlement of, uh, of the New Englanders went west. You know, they went west right through upstate New York. They went west right into Ohio. They went, kept on going through Indiana. They went around Illinois. They went right up to Minneapolis. And that was very much a Western city. When Thoreau visited that the year before he died in 1861, he said all of the lumbermen were from Maine and half of the men in, Minnes in Minneapolis were from Massachusetts that he met. And that's because it was a very, very New Englandy settlement in Minneapolis until the Scandinavian immigration and the Morrill Act and the Homestead Act and those sorts of things. So it wasn't until about the time of the Civil War that, that, uh, that the Western lands became overwhelmed and the Northern states were very, very New Englandy until about that time. <clears throat> so what makes Stonewall so common in New England is that it's a combination of three ingredients. If you take one out, you don't have any stone walls. You need hard rocks, not soft rocks that the glacier easily crosses. You need glacier bottom soils, you know, not meltwater deposits and not lake sediments and not anything uh, south of the glacial border. You need the hard rock till, you know, spread them out at the bottom of the ice sheet, uh, melt out the residue kind of glacial deposit. And then the third thing you need is that livestock tillage. It's often called animal husbandry, but I don't really like that term. Uh, I, I call it livestock tillage. The idea is that you, you're growing some tillage, a lot of it's livestock, lots of pasture, and lots of different kinds of animals to be taken care of and different ages of animals. So you need lots of fences uh, sort of intensively on a landscape to keep things separate. And I just call it livestock tillage. 
So the reason that we have so many uh, stone walls in New England is we're the only place in the country at a regional scale, the only place that combines good glacier bottom soils, livestock tillage farming, and a really hard rocks. And on the left, we have a uh, basic schematic diagram. If you basically drive from Boston to Buffalo, New York, and you cross the Hudson River, <clears throat> and you climb that plateau on the other side, pretty soon you notice all the walls are gone. They're all the way from Boston you know, to, uh, to basically the Hudson, and then they die. Why? Because you leave this region. Look at the map on the right, and you can see that. You just leave the region, enter the uh, Hudson River Valley, and they're gone. Sure, you've got a few in the Adirondacks. Sure, you've got some in the Catskills, but these are less densely settled because the rocks there, not in the Adirondacks, but, the, but in upstate New York, the flat open spaces there, a lot of limestones and shales and soft rocks, the glacier picks them up and just crushes them to pieces. Okay, if you go to Fairfield County, Connecticut, you've got stone walls everywhere. <clears throat> They're all over the place, concentrated. And you go through the Big Apple on the other side into central and southern New Jersey, the walls are gone. And the reason they're gone is not because you don't have hard rocks in the vicinity, and it's not because they didn't have a livestock tillage agriculture, you just cross the glacial border, which is right there at Staten Island and Long Island. You get on the other side of the border, they disappear. Now, if you are in Southern Maine, you got stone walls everywhere because there's lots of dairy farming and farms in Southern, Southern Maine. But if you go Northwest, they disappear. The walls disappear because you go into a wilderness woods culture. And so what you're missing, even though you've got hard rocks and even though you've got good glacial soils, you're missing the livestock tillage agriculture. And so basically walls disappear in all three directions from New England for three different reasons. And so New England is that place like the middle of a three ring Venn diagram, you know, where all three of those ingredients come together in New England and nowhere else. And so that's why they are the signature landform. And I use the word landform because there's just as much uh, organic uh, development. And I don't mean organic as in, as in fibric tissue, you know, from life. I mean, organic is sort of, it has, to, it has to happen. It's just part of nature. There's just as much nature as there is culture in a lot of New England walls. This is not true where they're more spectacularly well-developed elsewhere. Here, there's a mix, just a little bit of culture, but a heck of a lot of nature. Next slide. Okay, the Concord Geohistory. Now we're following chapter titles from the book Stone by Stone. If you wanna make stone walls, you gotta make the stone. So there's a title or a chapter in my book called Making the Stone. And basically you have to have the root of an old mountain system. We're talking about a geothermal factory about 20 kilometers, 15 to 20 kilometers straight down inside the earth. It's high pressure, it's hot enough. You know, it's hot enough to melt rock. It's hot enough to recrystallize almost everything else that didn't melt. You need to make those rocks in that hard furnace. And when you're driving the water out of rocks, when you're making them, okay, uh, there's all kinds of interesting chemistry going on. But if they're basically dehydrated and they come back up to the surface without a lot of water, they don't change that much. So what happened was after we had a mountain root and mountains the size of the Himalayas here, right over Concord, you have to exhume those rocks from a depth of 10 kilometers at least. By exhume, I mean just get them from the mid crust to the surface of the earth. And how you do that? Very, very slow erosion for 350 million years, just taking off the top of that mountain, like taking off the top of an iceberg floating in water. And you can keep chopping it down from the top and the bottom of that iceberg just keeps rising up to the surface until it's gone. Well, it isn't gonna be gone completely here uh, in New England, but basically what happened was we kept taking off the surface and the subsurface rose upward to greet us and that's where our rocks came from. But the stone is made from the rocks. The glacier comes down here, it's got an icy grip on the bottom, it quarries all that material, takes it apart, uh, breaks it up into stone and spreads it around to make sure every future farmer is gonna have some. So that's how you make the stone. Now we gotta bury the stone because nobody's gonna land you know, on, in, you know, from England and, and look out at a moonscape of stone and saying, yeah, this is a great place to farm, you know, especially if it doesn't have any trees. You have to bury that stone in order to get a decent, decent landscape. 
And Ralph Waldo Emerson understood this, and I quoted it in my book. In his poem, Wealth, is one of my favorite stanzas. And it goes like this, from ere the creeping centuries drew the matted thicket low and wide. This must the leaves of ages strew, the granite slab to clothe and hide, ere wheat can wave its golden pride. I know that's a lot to take in. You can go look it up if you like. But basically from the air, i.e. the carbon in the air, the creeping centuries drew the matted thicket. That's the vegetation that colonized after glaciation low and wide and covered the whole surface. And then the leaves of ages are strewing on that surface to make these organic soils in order to thicken the soil, the granite slab to clothe and hide, ere wheat can wave its golden prime. You have to make a soil and doing that for uh, you know 15,000 years after the ice sheets left Concord, you had a pretty decent surface soil. And Emerson caught wind of that pretty well. But then we took the, so, took the forest. So chapter four, taking the forest. <clears throat> and what happens here is that we change the microclimates. We change the soil physics about how deep ground freezes, frost heave, you know, erosion, loss of organic matter, thermal conductivity, one thing after another. You can read all the details if you like. But I actually ran numerical models to look at how, how uh, taking the forest changes the soils. Basically, the upshot of it is, is that the stones come up to the surface. And so that's the next chapter, copious stone. When you basically have a whole bunch of stone on the surface, I'm not saying there wasn't places without a lot of stone on the surface, there was. But in much of the, of the farmed land, you know, it came up later, maybe a generation, maybe two. It came up and then it kept coming up until, it, until there was so much of it, it kept getting scuttled aside and tossed by the fences. And then once it was in the fences, especially when you start running short on wood, what you basically do is you can make use of it to mark your boundaries, to gussy it up, to make it look better than your neighbors, you know, to make a fence out of it, to do whatever you like. But basically you can't do anything with a nickel, but you can do a lot with a billion nickels. You know, so if you've got lots and lots of stone after a generation of farming, uh, what you can do is start doing something with it. Now that copious stone came from the clearing and that's the diagram on the right, the lower right from Harvard Forest. You've probably seen that in various versions. Basically on the bottom is the calendar year from 1600, you know, to the right 2000. And you'll see that dashed line. That's just the New England population rising exponentially from 60 for 400 years. But if you were to look at the amount of clearing of the landscape, all right, what you'll notice is the big thick line in the middle, that's the clearing rate for all of New England averaged. Massachusetts is in the dark blue. And what you'll notice for Massachusetts in the dark blue, very, very slow clearing up until about the middle or early part of the 19th century, early part of the 19th century. And then a very, very steep downward drop right about to the time of Thoreau, 1860s. And look at how rapidly the deforestation was. And then, of course, it bottomed out and it started coming back when people left those rural farmsteads, you know, to go into the cities or go out west or go to the Civil War or go wherever they went. So there basically is a D, a cutting away of the forest and a return of the forest. And the stone walls that interest me most are the legacy of that deforestation and then reforestation episode. Okay. Um, Building walls. Yeah, once you get the stone, you build walls out of it. And that's a whole nother story. Land abandoned, uh, people left. I think I just alluded to why they did. I think you know that story. Basically, old fashioned semi subsistence farming or even market farming in Concord lost its allure. And we went into the industrial age, the railroads, you know, the industries, the cities, the urbanization, the opening of the frontier. There were lots of reasons why people walked away from their New England farms but there's a rural revival beginning from whenever, you know, and sometimes in the late 19th century in the Gilded Age, but especially in the early 20th century, uh, beginning essentially around the time of Teddy Roosevelt, there were acts asking people to go back and resettle wild lands or abandoned lands, resettle them, and that happened. Okay, that's, a, that's the short history. Next slide. And now the special conquered glacial handling. The stone on the, on the top there on the right, that's, those are milled stones. Those are rounded blocks of granite that were basically milled. If you take a pencil between two hands and shear them, what you'll notice is the pencil spins in your hand. 
The same thing happens in three dimensions with a stone. The edges get knocked off. And so any large, especially a granitic or massive or equant stone will be milled into the classic boulder shape. But there are lots of places, including this wall just below it. I think it's in Concord, but I can't, I can't be positive. I didn't date it well, where the stones are much more tabular and slabby and they make better walls, okay? But these were not milled off. In part, you can't mill a tablet into a rounded shape. All you get is a disc. Okay, but, um, but there's a lot of, of material in New England where the glacier was ripping it out and crushing it up, but it never really had a chance to get down in that shear zone and be milled. So instead it just melted out of the ice straight down and the ice died and stagnated, leaving a litter or a shroud of jagged stone. So in some places you get that rounded milled stone and that's very typical of Concord, by the way, because if I forget to say this, you used to have the subglacial Merrimack River run right over Concord. Maybe I'll remember to do that. <laughs> so let's talk about some other aspects of the handling. There's a diamond grain to Concord and other New England landscapes. The basic rock grain goes from Northeast to Southwest. And the glacial grain, that is the glaciers move in from the North Northwest and they head to the South Southeast. And what you have is essentially a diamond pattern there where you've got two dominant topographic elements cross cutting each other. And when you do, you end up with lots and lots of stone because of all of the ridginess. Uh, the glacier is not coming at, he's not flowing parallel to the corrugation of the landscape, it's flowing opposite the corrugation of the landscape. So you get oodles and oodles of stone and you get a landscape broken into sort of a diamond shaped pattern at the town scale. Uh, uneven distribution. If you go way up in Concord on the highest parts of the hills, you're gonna get bedrock balls. Thorough was fascinated with these. He also nailed the idea of drumlins too. You know, these are the, you've got one down there in Lincoln, Drumlin Farm, you know, where the Audubon Society has its place. There's, there's a lot of rounded hills um, up in the vicinity of Concord that Thoreau used to really, really appreciate when he climbed one right there at Concord. These are the streamlined, not rocky ones. And then much of Concord is covered by a melt-out till, just, just, just angular jagged debris left, let down from the surface. There's also places where, where very, very strong meltwater streams concentrated rounded boulders. Then there are places like the, 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 the sand plain at Walden that don't have, don't have stone because it's only river cobble. And then there are the lake beds, the vast Muscatiquit. Uh, you don't have stone wall there either because there is no stone because it's all buried by muds and then now by, uh, by wetlands. And finally, the uneven appearance. Even at the scale of Concord, uh, you have a proximal to distal relationship. The farther you get away from a, a ridge, you know, the, 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 the less you're going to have jagged stone. And the other part is that the Merrimack River now comes down from New Hampshire. I think you can kind of visualize that in your head. And then it takes a fishhook bend to the left or to the northeast. That fishhook bend is a post-glacial phenomenon. All right, but during the ice age, the ice sitting over, over Concord is, is, is forcing the Merrimack River to run right through Concord. It's in a subglacial tunnel, but it's running right there anyway. And so you have an abundance in Concord of rounded boulders, boulders that you're missing in adjacent towns to the east and west. And it's one of the things that makes Concord distinctive and its walls in Minuteman, uh, you know, uh, National Historic, uh, or state, you know, National Park. National Historic Park, it makes it distinctive because of the nature of the stone that has to do with the geologic history. Whew, now we're done with the technical parts of this talk. Let's move on. Okay, wall history and function. Oh, I could go on forever, but let me just say that, that there's two end members. One end member is somebody is looking at a patch of forest and they say, you know, this is going to look really great when I cut down all the trees, collect all of the stone and build nice border walls. And I don't think that happened very often. And then there's the other end of it. And that's that somebody goes in there and he cuts a forest down to make a farm. And he says, drat, I got all this stone. What am I going to do with it? And it starts accumulating along fence lines, right? And it just keeps growing, you know, perhaps for a generation or two. And then it just keeps growing. And the next thing you know, they don't have many trees. They need to use the stone for something. It's so big now you have to stack it up. And it's, you know, you go into a library, you don't find the books all over the floor, you find them stacked up. And the same thing is true when you go into a landscape that's covered with stone. If you scuttle it aside and stack it up, boy, the stone doesn't take up anywhere near the space that it would if it was just all sprawled out. And look at Block Island to the right there. I mean, that's an 1885 picture of Block Island, stone walls everywhere. 
And so basically it's a grid work or a mosaic or a set of polygons on the land surface that represent pushing out uh, you know, stone material away from the centers of fields that you care about to the edges of fields that you don't really care about. We care more about the stone walls and they cared more about the fields in the middle. And on the left, we have a beautiful picture of, of sorted stone polygons from Finnish Lapland. Now this is completely natural, but the same basic idea is there's a process going on that segregates initially coarse uh, glacial till into bands or polygons of, of coarse grain stone separated by fine grain centers. Now that's a natural phenomenon. You could argue that human beings in the middle of one of those plots on, um, on Block Island is much the same. It's a mechanistic outward push of stone to the edge. Next slide. And here on the upper left, we have two plots. One is from Petersham Mass and one is from Arctic, uh, just the Arctic. And one is completely natural and one is a, a field pattern of stone walls and roads. There's a similarity there. The one on the left is the stone walls. The one on the right is the, um, is the Arctic polygons. On the bottom, what you have are polygons formed by desiccation cracks on an old glacial lake bed. You know, so that's mud cracks. Those are, that's, a, that's the release of stress. And on the right, you have one of these big fat wide uh, rubble walls or getting rid of walls. Uh, that's also getting rid of stress, the stress of too many stones. And on the right, we have an ant hill, and the ant doesn't care about the hill. It just cares about the underground. It's just dumping that waste there, and yet it ends up looking quite interesting. So walls are initially getting started as, um, as, as, as sort of landfills or boundaries, you know, and then they become spectacular walls. And some walls are built right from the start. Next slide. I think I'm out. Yep, I finished this part. I can't wait to have the conversation. So thank you very much. Well, that was fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, no, no, no. My head is spinning, and you know, it's just one of those things that reminds you of you know, of those of us who are lay people who just walk by things all the day, all the time, and don't really understand what it is we're seeing. Um, uh, I don't want to not cover a couple of special walls in Concord, so I'm going to ask Allison to bring up those slides. Um, uh, which you sent to us. Uh, so why don't you tell us, uh, you mentioned already the <clears throat> Battle Road and the Minuteman Historic, National Historic Park. Uh, go, just, well, I'll just key you up and, and tell well, us this, what's the story is, you want to tell us here, Thor. I, I just went to, uh, you know, the, the Google and I said <laughs> Stonewall Concord, and this is the one that came up. And it's off of a website called Atlas Obscura, which is a really interesting uh, website. And it was when I was, uh, uh, you know, doing a it's, a, it's a public radio program um, and art site. And this is my photograph, you know? So basically I, <laughs> I took my unsourced <laughs> photograph off of the internet, uh, credited <laughs> Atlas Obscura, and that's okay. It's my candidate for the most important stone wall in the country. And it's right here in Concord. That's the boundary between the old man's property and the old North Bridge there in the background, of course, reconstructed. And, uh, and you remember the, the four approaches, the utility, the avocation, the story, and the system? You know, when I look at this wall, I think of utility. I, I go back to the military advantage of hiding behind a wall and shooting someone. You know, do you think those guys, the Minutemen, are really worried about what the wall looks like and, and who put it there and all that? No, they just want to they just want to hound the British all the way back to Boston. Um, and um, and so they're totally into utility. Uh, but before that, these walls are very useful for utility for the farmers that are there since 1635. I mean, that's the oldest inland settlement. You know, so six, seven, eight generations later, you know, they pretty much cut down all the trees and the stone is useful for boundaries and borders. And here's not a landfill that might have started as a rubber field, but it's a really nice fence, if you like, especially if it were topped with wood. So that's all about utility. But then evocation. For God's sakes, the old manse is right behind me. And, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, before he moved to his house over there opposite your museum, he's sitting up there looking in that second floor window at the old North Bridge or thereabouts, you know, over the top of this wall. And he writes nature. And that's the seminal turning point for this whole transcendental movement, you know, in Concord. That's a published book in 1836, started in 1831 when he's here. And I am convinced 
that overlooking, seeing this wall, is it natural? Is it human? Is it part of us? Is it not part of us? What is it? You know, really helped evoke the sense of that book, even though in the book, he doesn't mention the word wall. I don't care. It was there. He looked over it. It's also a touchstone for millions of people that come to these places. They want to see the stone walls. So what's the story? Well, Concord history is the story. You know, the obelisk out there, the Minuteman statue, you know, the old North Bridge, the battle, blah, blah, blah. You know, this wall is part of all of that. Parson Ripley's, you know, probably sitting on this side of the wall watching the action on the other side. Maybe he's upstairs. I don't know the details. But what's the system here? You know, if you look at that wall, you can start making interpretations from it. You can do essentially an above ground archaeology, which is really what I'm doing. And you can also think about the ecology. How did you get there? The human ecology, or for that matter, the new habitat, you know, the dry desert of an upright stone wall in an otherwise moist habitat. You create new habitat when you do this. So I think this is America's most important stone wall for reasons of utility, uh, reasons of history, and reasons of artistic inspiration. So there, I was going to say this even though you asked, even before you asked me. <laughs> you guys own it. Next slide. Now, if, if, if you look at a wall like that, or is, are there ways that you date it? Like, do you well, date? The, yeah. It, it's hard to date a wall. You can date them. No, it's hard to date a wall just from surface exposure because there's, you have to know the arboreal history of all of the, the shading and the canopy and the whatever to, lichens work for a, uh, maybe half a century and then they don't work anymore. Um, and these primitive walls, uh, in a place like Concord, it's hard to date a wall just from its form. More likely, you can date the stage, you know, before it was arrested, because walls get fancier and better as people get more money and have access to, uh, to more labor than they did before. Early walls are primitive, established farm walls are pretty nice, and also there's so much variability in the material, it, it takes some uh, getting used to, you know, to interpret uh, details out of a wall like this, but it can be done. Um, okay, so we've hit Emerson, and now let's hit Thoreau. So uh, talk about walls at uh, Walden or around Walden. Well, th let's go back. Okay, we can do this one. Um, I can do, I'll do this one here, and we'll go back to the other one. Uh, okay. Thoreau just loved stone walls. I have lots of quotes uh, in, in the, I read the journal twice, and I pulled out every quote I could the last time I went through it. And, um, and it's just the backdrop in Walden in the journal. I mean, I, I think I counted today 20 mentions of stone walls in Walden. I mean, it's easy with a word search. You just, you know, put a space wall and go for it. And sometimes he's talking about household walls, but, but most of the time he's talking about outside walls. And he loved them. He loved them and hated them at the same time. You know, he mostly loved them because of the, uh, the earthy raw material that they represented and the fact that they were artifacts of a conqueror that he was already uh, treating as archaeology. You know, the, the 17th and 18th, early 18th century stuff, you know, they, they really did spread out over the landscape and put lots of walls that were abandoned in his time. And he, he talked, there was a, um, there was a, a, a quote that he had. Um, he said, we walk in a deserted landscape. You know, that's a quote that he meant because he was seeing constant homes, you know, homesteads and farmsteads that were abandoned even in his time and overgrown in his time. And he really loved them as monuments to heroic settle settlement. Um, and he was careful, though, that sometimes he rubbed against walls and said, I don't like them because they're fences. And he had that same Robert Frost sentiment, you know, of getting making sure that you can get through the wall so he could go across lots, which is something he'd like to do. Mm -hmm. But he actually advocated for the preservation of walls as monuments. That's a big thing in, in uh, you know, in cultural attitudes right now, monumentations up and down. He was calling Stonewall's monuments to the, to the generations that were there before him that were basically laid up before King's Philip's War. He's got that in some of his quotes. He's speculating on the antiquity of walls. And he's an advocate for preservation. Another reason I think he liked Stonewall's is he just, he just couldn't get enough of, uh, of rock. He just loved it. I have a whole term for it. I call it descendentalism. And the idea is it's not transcendentalism. It's not going out and into, it's going down. He wants to go down to rocks. And there's that famous quote, one of my favorite, let us settle and wedge ourselves downward until we, you know, through the slime and the alluvion and da da da, and the fluff of opinion and blah, 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 down to something real. And we can call that reality. And what he's talking about is solid rock. And he just liked looking at the crust of the earth. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's all over the place in his journal. And then he said, my head is an organ for burrowing. I think I'll find a vein down there somewhere and go find real satisfaction down in the crust of the earth. And the very culmination of Walden is the, is the quote, you know, there is nothing inorganic. You know, he knows that life comes from non-life. And he's always trying to go down to the root of things. And uh, Stone was where he was at for him. He just loved granite as an elemental material. Uh, Walden Pond has some interesting uh, uh, wall observations on the next slide. Uh, so let's just go there. Yeah, these are two walls at Walden Pond. Now, what the heck are walls doing at Walden Pond? Well, they're, they're really not built there in Thoreau's era at all. The one on the right is, um, is if you go down the ramp to Walden Pond and you're going to start walking the pond path over to Thoreau's house, you know, you go, if you're on the beach, you'll walk by this wall. These are, these are the stones that that hill is made of. You notice how they're milled and rounded, just like I talked about. Uh, you know, those are, those are milled. A good example of this is take a sugar cube, you know, old fashioned square sugar cube, a box of them, and put them on a rug and then throw another rug on top of that and just drag the top rug over the bottom rug and then flip it over and look at what happened. And you know what happens. The sugar cubes have all rolled, you see, and they've dispersed out and they become rounded on the corners and you're left with a lot of granular sugar. So the lumps that are left, the rounded lumps that are left have been milled in that subglacial machine. But instead of it being carpet on carpet, it's ice on rock or ice on bed. And you get stones like this. And some of these are meltwater washed, you know, with colossal stream power, subglacial meltwater tunnels. But the one on the left, you cannot find any rocks like that or any stones like that in the deposits in and around Walden Pond. You know why? Those are, those are old fieldstone walls that were strip mined from some farm in the 1940s or 50s, brought down to Walden and used to build a retaining wall, you know, behind the, the part of uh, the East Beach over by the boat launch. You know, that whole row of stone down there by the, between the boat launch and the ramp, you know, is made of this stuff. And that's been hauled down from strip mine farms, you know, during who knows. It'd be great to try and figure that out. But those are very two different walls at Walden Pond. And they show the difference. I think Thoreau would be rolling over in his grave if he thought that the very, you know, sort of, uh, you know, punitive working farmers, you know, up there in the uplands were, were, were uh, and building all these stone walls, you know, that they would haul that down to Walden Pond to greet him when it's view. He, I think he would just have a field day. And the one on the right is more like his foundation. His foundation is built more of these kinds of stones because those are the natural stones that come out of Walden. So uh, I guess one more. No, one back, back one, back one. Uh, there, well, we'll start here, we'll start here. Um, I, think, I think that the, the, the most important national park that depends on stone walls is right in Concord. So I think you've got that too. You know, these are, the stone walls are an integral part of Minuteman National Historic Park. You just imagine the place without any stone walls. You know, it, 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 I just can't. Okay, so I, I've, been, uh, I've been studying these a little bit um, and I've been fascinated by them ever since I, I first came up, probably in the year 2000. Uh, to start talking about stone walls. I remember going there in about the year 2000. Uh, but let's look at the next slide. And I found some really interesting things in these walls uh, that are, you know, that have, uh, that are, you know, the Minutemen in their colonial costumes march right by them. And on the right, um, the stones, you see the pinkish stones there? I've been told that those come from Maine and they were quarried, brought in here by a ship and built on top of Lexington walls or on Concord walls. And, um, and, you know, I, I, I believe it. I believe it. But the more interesting one for me is the stone on the, on the left with the green arrow going to it. That's stone that was cut with a steam drill bit, okay? And it's at the bottom of one of those walls along the Battle Road. So we know that those walls were either rebuilt or moved or changed since then. And this is the kind of stonewall archaeology that I've been trying to do, is just taking a look at the stones carefully as an, as an, as an add-on to the history that we know from there. You know, it doesn't take anything away. It just basically, uh, you know, builds up the picture of multiple land uses through the years. So I've been involved with a couple of projects for the National Park Service, too. Um, so let's go one more slide, and that'll be the third slide you talked about in Thoreau's country. Um, I think we pretty much got it. Yes, I just have to say publicly that I've got a case about those uh, granite, cut granite pillars at Thoreau's house site. Um, that's a whole nother story. I'll leave it for now. Um, let's just put it this way. I'd like them gone.
okay? Because Thoreau detested hammered stone. He just detested it. And that's what it is. So let's move on. Oh, and here's a beautiful picture of Thoreau's country. Notice the drumlin has no stone up there, in part because it's easy to move it down on a convex hillside. And then the middle ground is where you have it all, and the terraces and the lake beds don't have it. That's where you have wheat with its golden pride. So uh, I like that illustration. Okay, I think I'm done with the slides. Okay, so uh, I know we know a third of your field is geology, but um, part of the reason why invite, we invited you is because we have this new um, exhibit of landscape paintings that include these stone walls. And really, I mean, part of the romance maybe of the walls are through poetry and through art. Um, so I thought I'd ask a couple of questions about that. So you mentioned Frost, I talk a little bit more about how the role Robert Frost has played in kind of um, the importance or you know, emphasizing the importance of these stone walls. In well, I, I, think, I think he was just at the right time and the right moment to span that, that it's complicated. Um, <laughs> Frost loves stone walls, obviously. They're in half of his poems, you know, and uh, Star in a Stone Boat, you know, Mending Wall is a famous one. He's Mr. Hardscrabble, um, you know, New England right. poetry. And he, he couldn't get enough of them. And I think more than anybody, he built stone walls into our consciousness. Um, I've read two poems by Mary Oliver recently, and they both are just lovely on stone walls. Uh, but he has a very, very different take. One of the things I think about Robert Frost, he penned Mending Wall in 1914, you know, and he was writing basically from that time in the next few decades, um, his sort of New England phase. And, and um, he's, he enters during what I call the botany window. And that is that if you, if you had a cleared farm with stone walls everywhere and you just walked away from it, what would happen to those walls? You'd get sprouted weeds in the field, trees would start to grow up, white pine, you know, and, and sumac and stuff. And the walls would be covered with ivy and you wouldn't be able to see them, you know, for maybe a generation. But when the trees grow up tall enough and they close their canopy and they shade out the undergrowth, guess what happens? You can begin to see the walls that you couldn't see for 30, 40 years because they were covered with weeds. And that's when Robert Frost comes on the scene and he sees these walls underneath the closed canopy forests. And it's just a shocking sight. Um, for me, it was when I first saw it. And, um, and I think that, that he, um, he loved Thoreau, he read Thoreau. He said, uh, uh, how can one guy get everything we have in America in one book? He was referencing Walden. And um, he also, uh, he, he thought a lot about Henry Thoreau. I think more about Thoreau than Emerson but maybe I'm wrong on that. So I have some questions from the audience. I always like to get to those. So um, do we know like where the oldest New stone wall is in New England? Can we date that or is that not possible? Well, to I think I know where it is. Um, and I, but I, I haven't heard any older ones. And it was a, a um, it's 1607. That's the same age as Jamestown. So there are really two Virginia settlements that went out in, um, in 1607. And one went to, uh, you know, Jamestown, where it is today, and they barely survived. I mean, they really had a rough time. But they did survive as a continuous settlement. And there was one up in the uh, Popham River country or Popham Point in Maine, southern Maine, you know, at the mouth of the uh, um, Kennebec, I think it is. And there was a settlement there in 1607, the Popham Colony, and we're not for a, a fact, fate of luck, you know. I mean, basically the guy who was leading it inherited land and he left and he went back and they built a ship here and went sailed back and gave up on it. Um, but that was in 1607. And so somebody visited that site uh, within the next decade and they noticed some garden herbs and an old wall, right, on that site, uh, right on that point. And so that's the oldest wall that I know of, that would be 1607. That would predate the oldest interior settlement, which is Concord. And early Concord was less about the hillsides than it was about, you know, the low sand plains and Musketaquit. Okay, I have another question from the audience. Um, if there are similar stones in form, are there different construction techniques between communities mm -hmm. in New England? And same question in the local area around Concord. Yes, I think, I think the uh, form of the stone gives rise to the form of the wall. I think that if you have a, uh, a, a rounded cannonball shaped stone, about the best you can do with that is build a, a triangle, you know, like a pyramid. 
you see those old, you know, war monuments with the cannonballs piled up in, in pyramids, you know, that that's about the way they stack nicely. It's really hard to build a nice looking double wall out of bowling balls made of stone. Um, or even watermelons built out of stone, you know, it's hard to do. But if you have beautiful book shaped, like each stone looks like an encyclopedia or a, or a laptop or a suitcase or something like that, it's really easy to build a nice looking double wall out of that. And also the payoff is better because you concentrate the surface area of the stone in a smaller area on the wall by doing so. So form and function go together. I think a lot more of the stone wall look has to do with the lithology than it does with the, uh, the individual who made it, but there's folk art in every wall. But I think fundamentally, it's about two things. What kind of stone is it? You know, is it one of these equant, large, massive uh, stones like a chunk of granite? Or is it a slabby one like a piece of schist or shale or something like that? You know, it depends on the shape of the stone. Um, and, uh, and then secondly, it depends on the glacial handling. Because if the glacier didn't mill off stones, they would all look like blocks like those sugar cubes, and you could build a decent wall out of those, but it milled them and rounded them, so it's harder. So your walls in Minuteman National Park are notoriously capped with, you know, rounded wobbly toppily stones. And, um, and that reminds me, to bring me back to Frost, when he wrote about Mending Wall, um, he really conflated two walls. He wrote that book when he was over in England, um, you know, just thinking about it. I don't think he had good notes. I think he just was using his memory. So he wrote Mending Wall. It's a lovely poem. Okay, but the two key, uh, one of the walls is the one that keeps you and your neighbor apart. You know, good fences make good neighbors. Uh, that's on the, on the west side of his property there in Derry. But on the east side is the one where you have balls, uh, stones that look like lobes and balls. And, um, and that's on the east side of his property. And so when you read Mending Wall, you don't, he doesn't say there's two walls because it's singular, but he's really conflating two of them. Um, and, and he just captured so much about the whole New England thing about walls in that poem that it's, it, it's, it's, it was my first understanding of New England walls. I was just a kid growing up in, uh, in Illinois at that time. And, um, and I remembered having to read that poem or hear about it, you know, when I was in grade school or middle school. Mm -hmm. And who would I know that I'd be uh, studying walls years and years later? Uh, I think this is a compliment, though. We, we've never had so many questions from the audience, so I'm happy to be uh, here's another superlative question. Do we know where New England's longest stone wall is located? I don't know. I, that's a really good question. It depends on how you define wall. Um, uh, because if you have a wall that goes around a field and it's all built, you know, with the same specifications, is that four walls or is it one wall? You know, mm -hmm. we have to decide. Um, is it a wall in a straight line or what? I, d I can't answer. What I can say is that it's more like a checkerboard. That would be like asking the question on a plaid shirt. You know, what's the longest square on your plaid shirt? You know, when they're sort of nested and embedded in a fractal pattern. Right. And, and I'm not sure the question is, I mean, it's an interesting one, um, but I don't think it's the one that's most important. I think the more important one is what's the length of the sum total of stone walls in New England. And of course the answer is nobody knows. Um, but the original estimate, the best estimate I was able to come up with was probably was about 240,000 miles. That's the distance to the moon that would wrap the earth 10 times. And that's like taking the threads out of a plaid shirt and lining them up, you know, end to end. And, and I, I, I have to believe in that number. There's got to be at least half of that left, hmm. but I don't, we're, we're going to know soon. We're going to know because of LIDAR and science map and, you know, uh, uh, citizen science. Uh, New Hampshire has a, uh, this, we know their landforms because the New Hampshire State Geologic Survey is coordinating citizen science mapping of stone walls, and they've mapped over 7,000 miles in just a year or two. That's how cool that project is. All right, we have a few more. We're coming up to the end of the hour, but uh, let me, I'm going to read this one just as it was written to be sure I have it right. My walls are nearly overrun by erosion. They're like retaining walls now. How does depth correlate with time? I suppose it varies by micro location. Yeah, it does. Did you, was that by retaining walls? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. Um, this is really interesting to me. Um, walls built on a slope, if the wall is basically parallel to the contour line, 
will bank up material on the upside and you will lose it on the bottom side. So the wall looks like a retaining wall. I call them false retaining walls. They're not built to hold the ups, the ground on the upside. They're just built. And then they capture this. One thing to remember about your hills in Concord is that the upper foot or foot and a half of sand, gravel, roots, sod, you know, humus, you know, the upper part of your soil is migrating down every hillside. It's a slow, steady creep, you know, of material. And so if you build a wall, uh, you know, it will catch the material creeping down on the uphill side and the material on the downside will creep away. So you can't date a wall by then, but what you can do is say that wall was built probably, um, uh, you know, quite a while ago in order to capture that much material. And I've seen, the, I've seen the creep material build up and push the wall right over and then bury it. Um, so it's really interesting. And that's, that's just so cool that the wall is taken from soil, built up and knocked back down into the soil. And uh, uh, that's, the, that's the coolest connection between Robert Frost and stone walls is that he knew what the number one killer of walls were and it was trees, uh, but he wanted to think it was frost which is why he opens the poem, something there is that doesn't love a wall. Right. Well, that's him. That's him. That's him. But he yeah. loves them. He's like yeah. Thoreau. He loved them and hated them at the same time. Okay, here's a double question. What is the mixture of stone derived from the underlying bedrock and stone transported long distances by the ice? And then this also asks, what's the most exotic stone you found in the stone wall? Um, <clears throat> okay, um, that's a really interesting question. In the book, Exploring Stone Walls, I differentiate the bedrock mix, which is if you just took the bedrock and smashed it apart. And then the second part of that is the glacial mix. You know, when the glacier runs over the rock, what does it bring in from the north and mix with the local stuff? It's more local than anything. And then there's the wall mix. When the person picked up the stone from the field and moved it to the wall, did they fractionate it? You know, did they pick certain parts and leave the others? And so there's, when you look at a wall, it's not necessarily representative of, of things. You have to work your way backwards um, through time as a sort of a forensic thinker. Um, but I think the vast proportion of, um, of stone in Concord's walls is probably derived within, uh, uh, you know, a, a kilometer or two because it gets crushed to sand pretty readily. That's why New England Southern beaches and Long Island are so full of sand. Uh, it's basically just crushed boulders. You can think of the bedrock as being crystalline. You can think of the sand on our beaches being the fine residue and the boulders left over are the stuff that was in the process of being crushed but didn't make it all the way. So I think that, that the most exotic thing I've ever found is, um, is um, just a super far traveled, uh, you know, meta quartzite that I would guess came from the Canadian Shield, um, but you know, one is never one is never sure. Okay, our last questions. There's two or three of them, but they're all fairly similar, and they have to do with um, kind of the native people and how they use stones and walls. So, is there a difference between native built walls and settler walls? Uh, what was the indigenous use of stone walls? Um, and again, similar question, when indigenous people created walls, um, were they uh, stone walls or piled stones? <clears throat> well, uh, in my definition, a piled stone will never be a wall because a wall has to be elongated. Um, I think that, that um, this is a very complicated question. We don't have good answers to it. Uh, we'll have to continue. There are walls that Thoreau recognized that were built by uh, uh, either the archaic or uh, woodland Indians is what they called them at that time, but they were weirs in the streams. Okay, they're perfectly legitimate walls. And those are probably the best built early walls. And Concord had a couple of those that Thoreau spotted. Um, the, uh, there's no question that, that, uh, that, that the natives or the indigenous uh, built, built up you know, mounds and effigies here and there and cairns, but the burden of proof is that is, is still on those who would claim a non-colonial or a non, uh, you know, new republic version of those walls. Um, it's not clear how many of them are indigenous or not. I have no doubt they would have built walls for blinds, you know, for containers, for various purposes, but the vast majority of walls, certainly the rectilinear field polygons 
you know, are, are, not, are not indigenous. There would be piles and low walls on the sand plains. I mean, Athara was very good about where the natives were, where he found artifacts and where he didn't, and they were basically low and down and near the river. And that's where you don't have a lot of stone. So I would say in Concord, virtually every wall was built, um, you know, if they're not being built today, they were built, uh, you know, during the, during the two, 300 years of settlement agricultural history. Or this has been fascinating, exactly what we hoped for, uh, right. exactly what was billed on the uh, description. So you have met your match. I thought I'd finish with just this uh, line from um, Star in a Stone Boat by Robert Frost. Some may know what they seek in school and church and why they seek it there. For what I search, I must go measuring stone walls perch on perch. And we have a wonderful evening tonight measuring stone walls with you. So. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank everyone who uh, tuned in tonight. And uh, please do come see this wonderful new exhibit called Home of uh, the Paintings of Lauren Coleman. We thank Allison for organizing this evening. Uh, yeah. So Thor, stay on for a minute. I'll say good night and good night to everyone. Whoever's out there, thank you for coming. And, and uh, I'm, I'm easy to reach. <laughs>